All right. So at this point, we're going to kind of get into more questions and talking about stuff. But I would love to hear what people want to talk about first. And we can make a list, and then we can make a priority of what we're going to put, what we're going to talk about. Um, so, shoot. Yeah, uh, I saw already CSA details. Uh, what details mean? To so details. I think I, I just want to talk a little bit about pricing, basket sizes, that kind of stuff a bit. And we can. If people are bored by it. We'll switch on. But it's something that I thought might be interesting. Yeah, that can be in there. Yeah. OK. This kind of pertains to fertility requirements, but more specifically, what kind of fertility um, requirements are for, say, another succession on a, on a plot? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like yeah. Turnover. Yeah. Top dressing, yeah. So as I mentioned a bit before lunch, this is actually one of the things I'm the least strong in, but I will try to answer those as good as I can. Yeah, I've never gotten a clear answer. Everybody has different stuff. Yeah. So I'd just like to hear yeah. People well, I'll give you the answer. Okay. <laughs> 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 Made it up, but <laughs> um, fake it till you make it. <laughs> okay. So um, how about another? Uh, any other questions? Building a food culture. Making sure that there is a market and kind of developing that as opposed to trying to break into like an established market. Mm -hmm. And when you say building a food culture, is this within a community or is this like you want to bring make the new kale? <laughs> uh, but like, uh, like in a community. Okay. Okay. Chartist. <laughs> Chartist. Chartist. Well, radicchio is the new kale. <laughs> Yeah, if, if you don't know this, this is what's coming up. It was out west um, for about five or maybe even ten years. Like, it's been a while. They've been, they've been really into the radicchios, the chicories. Um, I'm a big fan, so I like that. And this last year, we just saw it break through in Montreal. And in the last two years, kind of the northeast has begun to embrace it a bit on some farms. So you can be ahead of the curve. <laughs> Breaking news. <laughs> but um, yeah. Deer? Yeah, or any regular animal. I didn't know, generally speaking, if there was any kind of best practice for eating. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I know tomorrow you're going to talk about the co op season. Yeah. Um, are you going to talk about that in comparison with other ways or just about. I'm going to talk about the co op system and I'm going to talk a bit about human, uh, like HR and managing people and stuff tomorrow. Yeah. The co op's going to be a kind of a, a, a lens that they're going to use to talk about um, interacting with people on the farm in general. Okay. Yeah. I was curious if, if you had another system before or just. just well, we started as a co op. We started, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Food safety. Food safety. Yeah. Okay. Are these topics sound good to people as things to talk about? Okay. Um, I'm going to jump in first in the crop rotation. And then maybe that'll lead into some of this. And then we'll see how we fit the other things in. Um, so um, our farm, or I'm going to talk about our crop rotation and the thinking that goes behind it. And you can use that how you wish. <laughs> so we start off with a three unit or three part of our crop rotation. So in one year, year one, we'd have a heavy feeder. So this is a crop that has high, usually nitrogen requirements and would need to have compost or manure spread beforehand. And so like brassicas, like the broccoli family is in there, tomatoes, squash are in there. Um, and then the next would be a light feeder. So this is crops that don't require as much fertility. Something like carrots, beets, um, beans, peas, um, lettuce um, that don't require as much fertility. There's also kind of a group that's in between that like the onions, leeks, that they don't, they're not quite heavy feeders, but they're definitely not light feeders. Okay, So we'll, we'll talk about them a bit too. 
And then after two years, we do a year of cover crop, CC. And then we repeat. So heavy, light, CC. This is over six years, the same parcel. Does that make sense? Um, do you all know why we do crop rotation? I don't have to sell crop rotation to anybody. I'm kind of jumping in right away. Um, just in case anybody doesn't know, crop rotation is the practice of rotating your crops through time. And the reason you do it is that crops within the same family are, tend to be susceptible to the same diseases and the same pressures. So by changing up the families, you're breaking disease cycles and breaking um, uh, pest pressure. Also, different crops use fertility at different levels on the ground. So rotating crops means you use the fertility better. They also have different competition of weeds. So rotating crops means you can break those cycles. Um, integrating cover crops also is a place where you can inject fertility and organic matter without necessarily applying compost and other inputs. Okay? That's kind of why crop rotation is used. And um, you know, when we talk about organic farming, whether you're certified or not, um, ecological farming, we talk often a lot about what you're not supposed to do. You don't spray chemical pesticides. You don't use chemical fertilizers. You don't use genetically engineered crop. There's all kinds of things like that. But what really organic farming is about is about feeding the soil and having a healthy soil. And on healthy soil, healthy plants grow. And healthy plants are better able to resist disease and pest and pressure and should be healthier for us to eat. Um, and that's the concept behind organic soil is really about feeding the soil and, and, and working up from there. And so crop rotation is one of the tools to really respect the soil better. Um, does that sound, you guys agree with that? <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> so let's jump into the details then. So we've already done this. So you have another SOSA's year one, two, three, four, five, six, and then I keep going H, <laughs> you know, like you see that plan. Um, in terms of fertility in this, we would put fertility in around August here. And so we spread chicken manure. We can get it from, uh, it's poultry manure. We can get it from um, some local operations, uh, what, chicken manure. Around August, we spread it here. Then put another cover crop, or destroy the, spread it on the cover crop, incorporate that, put another cover crop over it, and then the next spring we're ready to plant. And we just use the residual fertility for that light feeder. And then here, we're going to put another, you know, another uh, blast of uh, fertility, and that's going to feed the next things. Um, now, this is in a context where we tend to grow one crop in an area in a season. If it was something that's like we'd grow broccoli for seven weeks, we might still have 15 weeks of growing time after that or something. We'll put a cover crop after it. We don't, we don't, we don't double crop. Um, so if you were double cropping, you might not be able to get two years off of one fertility uh, amendment. And so in that case, um, you might be wanting to side dress or put compost before your next crop. Um, so I'll talk more about that. But if let's say this was onions here instead of like just a general light feeder. They need more fertility than, than this, so we would do a little bit of extra fertility in the fall here, getting ready for that. So always aware of what the requirements are. So that's the first thing in what fertility requirements are, is does the crop generally need fertility? Now, if you're dealing with successions of lettuce or of radishes that don't tend to need as much fertility, they still like fertility. Um, and you can kind of base on the previous crop if it has a lot of nice foliage and it's, it's growing well, that might be an indication that you don't need to necessarily put fertility down. If it doesn't seem to be doing so well, and it's not because you didn't irrigate it or something else, but it like, doesn't seem to have the same vibrancy, maybe it would require some fertility. So that's a little bit of like, it's an eyeball test. Um, <coughs> but um, if you were doing three or four crops in the same area, you would definitely put in fertility at some point in there spreading. Okay. But I'll take this picture back out to this level here of the crop rotation. So 
So that's kind of fertility within this context. Now is, what are the crops that we put in these blocks? So we tend to grow, I'll get rid of onions for the moment, we tend to grow a lot of brassicas, which are heavy feeders, and we also grow a lot of cucurbits like squash, zucchini, and that kind of thing, uh, plus uh, tomato family. Now, in this example, let's say the brassicas are the same size as both of these together. You know, so the first heavy feeder, we'd put that. Second heavy feeder, we'd put this. We wouldn't put two brassicas one after the other because these also happen to have, um, well, especially tomatoes have a lot of disease. Um, brassicas have a certain amount of disease, a certain amount of pest pressure. So breaking them up like this means that you don't come back to brassicas more than once every six years. Same for cucumbers, same for tomatoes. Now, with uh, onions and leeks, they also have a, a fair amount of disease. So maybe half of this light block would be alliums. And we would fertilize before we put them in. And then the other half would be just a mixed bag of light crops. Carrots, beets, lettuce, blah, blah. And here, we have that same mix that comes back. So these come back one and six, one and six, one and six. This is one and three. These crops don't tend to have as much disease pressure. In general, sometimes things change. We've recently started to have downy mildew and basil. And um, we've begun to, though it's more weather type thing, we're still rotating more carefully with that. You might have specific carrot disease or otherwise that if that's the case, you take the measures, you know. Um, but um, um, yeah, does that make sense so far? You follow me on this? Manure? Just to the whole bed or just to the section where they cover crops to So, um, so the way I'm looking at this is this is one block. Maybe this is block 201. And this would be 2019, 20, 21, 22, 23, 2024. Okay? So I'm looking at a specific block, how it looks in time. Now, there might be block 202 over here. And 202, like, it would be that, like this, it might be the heavy feeder here, and the light feeder, and the cover crop, heavy feeder, light feeder, and cover crop. And then 203 would be, you know, the cover crop, heavy, light, cover crop, so forth. So it's kind of cascading. But, so, what I'm talking about this is in time, that the times that we would spread chicken manure would be in the, in the August, the late summer, the, that's a horrible sign, but the late summer, the month, uh, the year before for the following crop. Does that clear things up for any who, yeah? Any other, any other questions about comprehending how this is working? Um, do you, when you're selecting your seed for the cover crop, do you take into consideration, like if you planted brassicas in 2019, would you plant daikons in 21? Um, so, as a market gardener who does brassicas, we stray away from brassica cover crops. I, I, I mean, that would violate your rotation. Yes, it's, it's problematic. And especially something like daikon that you might have for a long time, that really has potential to build up a problem. So we avoid uh, brassica, like mustards or daikon in our rotation. Um, in terms of what we do put in our rotation, and it is possible that what I'm going to talk about does not work here in terms of uh, your, your, your weather, but I'll just think of the thinking behind it. So if we had, so a cover crop, so um, when there's a crop, if it finishes, let's say, if we have enough time in the fall, we will sow a cover crop after. And so something like here, if we were finishing, let's say, before September 1st, Actually, it doesn't really matter what, but if, if there was enough time in the fall, we would sow, tend to be oats or rye. Do oats winter kill out here? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So it's, so it's going to work, <laughs> what I'm going to tell you. Um, so we'd sow oats or rye, um, or oats and peas, and maybe rye and vetch. And the oats and peas will winter kill, so if we're planting something early, and that's a good cover crop to do, because then... We just go in, we work up the soil and we plant. 
something like Ryan Vetch is going to take off in the spring, and it's a lot of work to destroy, so you probably want it to head out and produce um, seed heads, and then it's easier to mow and either plow under or disc. Um, there, um, let's talk about occultation afterwards. Um, yeah, so that's kind of, so if we have rye and vetch, it's that we're intending it for to continue to the next year, so either something that we're planting relatively late, or it could be going into a cover crop. I mean, that's fantastic that we can do that, you know. And um, if there's enough time, it'd be even great to put an alfalfa or some kind of red clover. But just having it in one year might be a bit short. So we put something like that in, the cover crop, we destroy, and then we would put in oats and peas if it's going to winter kill, or if we can afford to let it, let it wait in, we put rye and vetch. Um, so we do try to put as many cover crops as we can in the other years, too, just to build up um, fertility. And this is something that is more the case on that two plus acre farm. The less space you have, the more that cover crops are costly on your farm. And so um, what happens on a lot of smaller farms is you just put a lot of organic matter, a lot of compost, and not cover crop. And there's a lot of following the same crops one after the other. And they tend to be crops that don't have as much disease, and you're only growing them for four weeks or five weeks, so um, you get rid of them before the disease can take over. But it's not to say you can't have problems. Um, there's a lot of like, um, like gray molds and white molds that can happen on lettuce. And so um, it's still good to have somewhat of a rotation. But it's maybe not quite as strict. It might have to just be kind of a little bit mentally that you're you're shifting. Um, yeah, does that make, is that clear, that distinction between kind of like a small farm and a large farm in terms of crop rotation? Yeah. So getting back into the fertility requirements, um, so I have talked about spreading. So there's a, different things of fertility, you know. One is, so we use chicken manure. It's not composted. But we put it down in the fall before so it's in the ground a long time before anything's going to be harvested off of it. There probably are different regulations that you have to respect of how many days after spreading raw manure can you harvest a root crop and a veg crop and a leaf crop. They're probably different. Um, so that's something to respect. Compost, if it's, if it's well composted and that means something legally, how, what the compost is, you can spread it closer to the time. Um, there's some other products that you can side dress with that you don't have, have restrictions. Um, yeah. For the people, the couple of people who had this question, are there specific things beyond what I've said that you'd like me to answer? Do you ever add um, micronutrients like calcium, magnesium? Micronutrients, we don't add micronutrients in general. Our soil was fairly fertile when we started. Um, so we haven't really worried about that. Case of like, um, like uh, magnesium, is that right? Mag Manganese and um, and uh, and boron. So there's, there's some specific things that are deficiencies that when we have seen those signs in the plants, like if you have cauliflower, there's certain ways the leaf looks, or beets have certain problems. In those cases, we would spread, we would apply um, a boron uh, specifically for that. And um, um, but um, but that's not as a as a systematic method, you know. We've really been working on cover crops as a way to build our soil rather than, than micronutrients. Um, so I can't speak about that specifically beyond that. Um, do you do uh, compost teas in this? We don't do any compost teas. Not to say that they can't work, but um, we haven't felt the need and we don't have the time. <laughs> yeah. How regularly do you do soil tests? We soil te we do soil tests every year that's in cover crop before we spread the manure. And theoretically, the manure spreading is in function of what the soil test tells us, but we're doing it with an old manure spreader, so we have very little actual way we can regulate it. So, but at least we know. <laughs> and, and it is a good thing to do some soil testing. Um, it's hard to soil test everything, but it's good to kind of, and it's good to do your soil tests the same time of year every year because that's something that, because some things change during the year. So kind of taking the same time under the same conditions gives it more 
a, a more clear picture of what you're actually measuring. Yeah. Can I move away from the fertility piece? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll get into the occultation here. So what we would do with the cover crop, um, there's a couple, there's different ways to approach cover cropping. Um, one thing to be clear about what a cover crop is, is a cover crop is a crop that grows up, you don't harvest something over it, you mow it, and you incorporate it, or you incorporate it in fully. You don't take a grain crop off of it, you don't take a hay crop off of it. If you take those things, you're stealing some of the benefit that the cover crop does. Not that it's a bad thing for your farm, but you're not getting the full benefit off of it. So um, what we do, one of the things cover crops do is good for weed control, but if you let your, your cover crop just grow up and not mow it, weeds can go underneath and you can have weeds, annual weeds that set seed in that cover crop. So we try to mow bef like regularly our cover crop. You'll let it go to about this high, you know, and then we'll mow it and then let it go again. And that's helping kill the, 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 um, the, the annual weeds. It also is kind of a root pruning that happens. So it stimulates organic, like the, 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 the root production in the ground and it kinda, that kind of creates some of the organic matter. Um, and then at the end, we'll pass with a disc and we'll incorporate the cover crop in. Now, this is all tractor oriented that we have. Um, if you have a BCS walking tractor or no tools, this might be a little bit intense. Um, so something that um, is becoming more popular, this is part, J.M. Fortier has, made this, has, has brought it to popularity, is occultation. And so that is a process of taking some, like a black silage tarp and putting it over an area in preparation for um, the bed, the crop that's coming after. So you cover the crop. So first, so if you're dealing with a bare soil, you would water first to get good conditions for germination, and then you cover it, and then that heats up the soil, the, se the weeds germinate underneath, and then they die because there's nowhere to go, and they compost, and when you take it out, three or four weeks later, you've take, flushed out most of the weeds, and then you can, um, plant into that. You don't want to till at that point because if you till you're working more, more weeds up. Now this same technique can be used to deal with cover crops. Um, so if you have a flail mower attachment on a BCS, you can mow the cover crop, chop it up, it falls on the ground. Um, you could also try to do it not mowed but mowing will help and then put the occultation plastic over for three or four weeks. And it really will, in the, in, the, in the heat of the summer, it will do a number on that, that, that stuff, and it's going to really um, uh, start the decomposition process. And that's one way to get rid of something like rye, which you couldn't do if you didn't have that tool. Go. With the rest of the crops, you harvest the whole plant, or you leave the rest? But like, uh, like if we're talking like a lettuce, or? For example, yeah. Oh, so we harvest the part that we need. <laughs> and yeah, so when we're harvesting a lettuce, you know, you cut down, you cut the head, bring it out, maybe peel an extra layer off just to make it nice, put it in the bin. We get it as close to market ready in the field. Um, if we're harvesting beets, we pull them out to clean off an outer leaf, um, I mean, arrange them nicely, put an elastic around it, uh, put it in the bin. And then that stuff gets sent back to the wash station, and then the wash station, they're just washing. You know, um, they're spraying down the beets. Um, Head, it, head lettuce just all gets tossed into a big bin and kind of gets hydro cooled. Then they take it out, let it trip, and send it out. So we really want to leave as much stuff in the field. Yeah. Okay. The so, occultation plastic is clear? It's black. black. Yeah, it's black. Okay. So some people do use pl a, a clear plastic. That's called solarization. It's going to be a lot hotter um, than, uh, than the occultation would be because um, it's like a little greenhouse. <laughs> yeah. So we, uh, do you have any pictures? No. Um, we, use, we use a couple different bins. For a long time we used Rubbermaid bins that we'd harvest into. Um, we, there's, um, um, we use, sorry, we use bins that are the same size as Rubbermaid bins, um, but that we got from a company out in BC. So they're like, I think it's called the cucumber bin. Um, but they're the same dimension, so I don't know what that is, like 22 inches by, 
yeah, by f something like that. Some, that sounds kind of familiar, 22 by 14. And they're maybe like 10, 12 inches high. I don't know. Um, and I like that kind of size. Um, so this is kind of like, if you know your Rubbermaid bins, there's like a low one, a medium one, and a high one. This is the medium one, OK? And I find it's a nice size to put under your arm. Um, there are some bins, like there's a place uh, south of Montreal called Zubois that does a lot of harvest um, equipment. And I just find it very big. And it's heavy when it's full. And it's kind of uh, uncomfortable. So I like something a little bit smaller. Um, I think it's just better to respect your body. Um, yeah, I don't know what is available in the States or what you get. Um, um, some grocery stores don't send back their crates if some of the produce comes in. They're literally just thrown away. Hmm. So some grocery stores will just let you have them. And they are obviously for produce because of their produce is coming in. Yeah. There are some black flats that have roughly this kind of dimensions, but kind of like, like um, slats or grill a bit on the side that um, are called tulip, flat, tulip flats that are often available for like two to five dollars a piece. Um, in some areas they go really quick because there's a lot of growers that use them and they're a lot cheaper than almost anything else but they don't have a lid you know um, they don't nest they, like so what's nice is a bin that can nest so the there's some bins that uh, they might have a shape um, let's say like this and so one way you put it They'll stack when it's different, and when you flip it the other way, they kind of nest. And it's nice because it takes less footprint when you're storing it. Whereas some of these black flats, you just have to keep piling them up, and it takes a big footprint. Um, yeah. One thing about bins is I think it's great to have the least diversity. <laughs> Try to make things, you know, one type of thing. And so, and um, another thing is it's nice to have separate bins that are leaving the farm and separate bins staying on farm. Because bins that go into the field, they do not look so pretty, you know, no matter how much you scrub. So we have a set, like on farm, we have a set of, that's actually because we've been around for so long and Rubbermaid's changed colors, we have a set of the, the older colors are the field bins, and then the new colors are the off farm bin. And so we have, we use rubber, so, so we use Rubbermaid still for stuff like salad mix and some of the bunched greens just to be able to seal them in and keep some of that humidity and that moisture in so they don't, they don't dry out. But just about everything else, we put in open flats that are about the same dimension that can, can nest. And, um, and that makes us fairly happy. Um, yeah. Do you still buy Rubbermaid bins or have they stopped making them? Did they, Did they stop making them recently or? About a year or so ago. Okay. So, no. <laughs> Yeah, Sterilite, and I'm not a big fan. Yeah. Um, or husk. Hmm? Or husk. I don't know those, I don't know those but uh, yeah. What about recovering? I'm sorry. Or, what why don't you go first? Recovering uh, your, your containers. Like, uh, is that a problem? You mean uh, when you drop them off? Right. Oh, if you're dropping them off, I wouldn't drop one of these off. <laughs> you know? Um, you might have some place you have a really good relationship, but a lot of these bins are going to be something between like $5 and $10 a bin. So that's, that's more than you want to drop off. Um, in that case, if you're actually dropping it off, that you, might want to, you might be investing in waxed boxes. And those cost a couple bucks a piece. You can ask the pr people to, um, to, uh, to hold on to them and give them back to you. But that doesn't always work out. It depends on, uh, uh, depends on, the, on the, uh, the contractor. Yeah whether people will do that. Um, yeah. So when I was, I was talking more in terms of going to CSA or farmer's market of bringing that. And for CSA, um, we, um, maybe we're sipping into CSA details. Maybe that a good transition at this point? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'll about the really quick. Okay, then I'll get, yeah. Okay, uh, so if you're putting the, the chicken manure down in August, when are you pulling that tarp over to kill that cover crop? Okay, so we're not using we we're not like we're not farming that way. <laughs> like, we don't use occultation to kill a cover crop. We're, we would like put a chicken we chicken manure over it, and then we till it in, and then we're putting another cro their crop in going going forward. Yeah, I think that if you're using occultation as part of your bed prep, and you're really um, and you're in a smaller area, and you're not doing a lot of cover cropping, I wouldn't use chicken manure. You may, maybe there's like uh, I don't know if Actisol is down here, but sometimes there's like pelleted dry chicken manure or compost and stuff that you can. Um, that you can use without having to wait a period. That can work, or some kind of other compost. 
but I, I don't think you can fit manure into an intensive system that has a lot of successions. Um, yeah. Okay. So I will just get rid of this rotation. And uh, we'll talk about CSA. So um, I'll start from what a CSA looks like, just want to keep that thought, is you can do CSA baskets that are pre-made, that you make on the farm, and you bring somewhere and someone pick them up, or you can put stuff out, like at market, and have a list of what people get. And so we use a market style, um, and the reason that we do a market style is that it's less labor of actually preparing the boxes, and it also is easier to do choices. So if you're going to make boxes, it's kind of, now there is a whole world of software, there's like Harvey that's been launched, that lets you really do two order individual boxes where you post a standard list of this is what's going to be in the basket and your clients can swap in and out what they want and adjust it. And then you have to prac each box individually. This is fantastic for customer you know, relationship and, and, and service, but it's a bit of a headache. <laughs> you know, though I have talked to some growers who actually like it more. But, um, but if you have a standardized, if you're giving everyone the same thing, um, it's hard to do choices. If, so if you run out of something and you have 200 shares to fill, maybe you're giving random stuff. In the, well, not random all, but like one or two items that are different. So when it's a market style, it's easier to say, you know, carrots or beets or leeks maybe is a choice that you have one week, just to kind of manage your, your sizes. There's also, um, there's different things about, um, you know, do you drop your CSA baskets off somewhere? and you come back later to pick up empty boxes? Um, or do people take them home and then the next week they're supposed to bring back the empty box um, and they don't see you? We really like to have that direct contact with our clients. Um, we've been f in CSA for 15 years. I was on CSA farms about five years before that. And the direct link with the client, I think, is one, like, so you are giving them great vegetables. And that is what, like, that's the reason they join your CSA. And they will stay for great vegetables, but the link with the farmer is the next best thing for them, and that's what makes it special. And so um, I like to be able to talk to my eaters. <laughs> so when people come to our drop-off, I have a clipboard, and I have their name, and they show up, and I know almost everybody's name. You know, newer people, I have to learn the name. They show up, and I say, hello, so-and-so, and I check their name, and we chat a bit. And I chat just enough to not slow the line down. <laughs> And then we have people who go in the vegetables, and we actually um, we serve the basket out or the, the, the share out of the bins themselves in a row, um, as opposed to putting them on a table, so it's easier to kind of replenish. And we have people go down both sides so that it just makes the flow easier. And we also space the bins out a little bit so that people don't cluster around the bins. Um, and if something like potatoes or carrots is bulk as opposed to in bunches, we will put containers for them to measure out by volume rather than a scale to measure by weight. We just want it to flow and, uh, to, get, and to get through. So when people show up, I talk to them and then they head down and at the end uh, one of our staff is there and who might be selling extra stuff or have special orders and they're at the end and they kind of chit chat a little bit also. Um, and that contact, like we have people who've been with us for the 15 years and I know who they are, you know, and that relationship is is something that you build, and it's um, um, we in our you know we started off for farm, so I would recommend I don't know I think I already said this, but I don't know if it did. If it's your first year, start with a very low number of CSA shares, five to ten. We started off with 110, so don't follow our example. But we were five people who had worked on CSA farms. I had managed a CSA farm, so we were jumping in with ambition and I think some skill. <laughs> Um, and, but but, but we, we pulled it off and we had a waiting list. It was great baskets. We had a waiting list for a few years. And then in our third or fourth year, a couple of the farmers I farm with had kids. And so some of them decided to take the summer off to be with their family. And we decided to drop one of our smaller CSAs that wasn't going as well. We kind of streamlined a bit and things were fine. And then afterwards when the farmers came back on the farm, we wanted to expand again and we realized we couldn't, you know, we'd hit a plateau. We kind of, around 260 shares, we couldn't get past that. And we were very surprised because we were hoping to get past that. And um, what year was 
that was uh, something like around 2010, 2011. Um, and it, there's a lot of things that can go into that. So um, in terms of the year, it's a couple years after the, the recession. And it kind of hit Quebec a little bit later. Canada was a little bit more insulated because the way the banking system works. But there's kind of a ripple effect that we kind of got hit a bit after. It's possible it's related to that. But I think one of the things that happened is that when we started, we were really excited, you know. And that excitement was transmitted. transmitted. People really liked it. And, you know, you've seen how we do some of our planning. <laughs> And kind of looking at profitability, and we were making decisions profitability-wise, and not that we weren't valuing our customers, but there was a kind of a profit and streamlining process that was happening first. And I think that couldn't help but kind of transmit a bit. And we kind of lost track of the client as the number one thing, and kind of making some decisions based on stuff that worked better for us. Um, we also had been taught by some of the older CSA farmers who were kind of hardline about, if you miss your basket, you lost it, you know. If you if you sign up for the gym and you don't go one week, you don't get to add a week at the end, you know. And like so that that's how it is with your basket. And so we kind of, I mean, a bit of an entitled perception, but we kind of inherited some of that. And I think things like that, it makes it like if 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 you're an eater, you know, and you can't make a certain week, you don't want to necessarily lose your vegetables, you know. And um, especially if you know in advance and you wanted to schedule, but no, we don't do vacations. <laughs> but <laughs> so. There are things that we changed, things that we realized at that point there was a problem. And it's hard to pinpoint exactly what the problem is, but there's a lot of things that we saw that we could change. And um, so one of the things we did is we did a deep dive. We looked at our number, we looked at all the people who've been signed up with us over the years, and we looked at you know, who was, was still with us, and we could see our retention rates. And we could see that at this point, um, our retention was lower than it had been and our recruitment was lower than it had been. So those are two bad things, you know, because you either keep your people or you get new people. So if you're, not, if, if you're lower on both of those, that, that's a bad thing. And so we did a real pivot, and we started to realize, we, start, we did see that there was something like 40 people who had been with us since the first year. And everyone on that list, we recognized. We knew exactly who they were. And, um, and we kind of realized that it wasn't so much about getting new members, but figuring out, how can we please people like this? You know, how can we make it so that they're getting what they want? And that really changed our approach to the CSA. And so we did some things like we started sending a weekly newsletter as opposed to an occasional newsletter, just so that people could get news from the farm and feel like they're hearing from us. Um, we tried to get more choices in, and we looked carefully at kind of what kind of, what kind of things people wanted for vegetables. Um, one thing people want is they want stuff they know. <laughs> sure, it's fun to discover new things and weird things, but you want to eat what you like eating. And so we you know, really focus on carrots, potatoes, tomatoes, lettuce, um, now kale. But back then, kale was not something everybody knew. <laughs> and um, um, so, so we kind of, these are things that, that we did. And I think there's also something that happened. I started, like, I, I can speak for myself. Um, not necessarily, I've been on the farm, but I started to realize that each person that we kept was the long term of the farm. And so if somebody stays with us for 20 years, and on average is $500 that they're giving us a year, that's a lot of money. And what if they also happen to buy $100 of extra produce? And then they also bring their friends in. So um, not that I started to see dollar signs on everybody. <laughs> that's not what I'm trying to say. But you started to realize that so we were important to them because we were feeding their family. And they knew that. But they were also important to us because they were keeping us afloat and keeping us going. And understanding that and really appreciating something changes that. And so we have five drop-offs where we do farm, uh, where, 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 where we drop stuff off. Two of them are run by farmers. So I run one of them. And uh, my co-farmer, Renee, runs another drop-off. And then we have three that are run by staff who have been with us for like two to four years. And the two drop-offs that have the farmers running them have retention rates in the low 80s. And the three drop-offs that have staff running them have retention rates often in like the mid-60s. And this is nothing about the staff not being great. It's just that they don't feel it in their bones what that relationship is. But like myself, you know, having been with these people for 15 years, having seen tough times, and I, I really recognize it. And I'm very grateful that they've chosen to keep 
keep working with us. And I want them to know that. So that changes that relationship. And being physically at that drop-off point is, and talking to them and telling them how to use vegetables and you know, chit-chatting with them and telling them what we're going on in our life and talking about what's going on in their life, that's how we express that gratefulness and that's how we work on that relationship. And I think that that's something that when you just drop baskets off at drop-offs and you're not there as a face, you don't have that. And it's easier to replace you with Whole Foods or something else than when you're actually physically there. And I think that as the, as, as the local food movement changes and as there's more and more players who are doing organic food and ecological food and even local food, it gets harder to distinguish yourself and, um, and, and harder to have that relationship. And so that's what you need to do. So I'm kind of going back to the, re the relationship rant, but, um, but that's, that's kind of the base of, of where our CSA is. And so just to say that's why we do market. <laughs> And as doing a market drop-off, people have to bring their own bags so they're not stealing our bins. <laughs> and, um, and if you are dropping bins off, um, that's where it can get trickier of having people come back. You may have them have a deposit, but it's always tough chasing after somebody for stuff. Okay, so um, I'll go into more details about CSA. Um, so we, I'm going to talk about our CSA. And we could talk about variants that people want, but at the basic, we charge $30 a week. And we aim to give 15 to 20% more than what people paid for based on our farmer's market prices. So we're aiming to put $36 a week in there. And we give this extra because often people are paying part or all in advance. So you know, that's a big risk to taking on us. And there's, there, there's stuff that they're receiving they might not choose to get. You know, so they have a little less control. So that's one way to kind of offset that. And so, oh, is this a question there? No, OK. So this is what we're putting in a week. And right from, so we do a 22-week CSA. From week one to week 22, we're trying to hit these numbers. And that's as opposed, so that means that every week we're trying to hit, you know, like, I don't know, 33 to $36 right through. As opposed to like starting with like 25 and then going up to like 38 and then finishing with like 35, you know, because there's more abundance here. And um, we talked a bit about that earlier in terms of weekly, weekly stuff, but you can have a crop failure here. And then it's really hard to catch up on this. Now, we don't tell people exactly what the dollar value is in the basket, but they can tell. You know, they can tell what's a small basket, what's a big basket. Or so they think. <laughs> Sometimes it's how you spread out your drop off and you make it look a little bit bigger that makes it look more abundant. And that's what they remember. They don't necessarily remember what's in the basket. Um, we've also done some things where you can choose like three of six items and then like four other things. And what happens is we'll put the choices closer together and then the other stuff after. And it actually makes the, ba the, 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 the basket look smaller than if we had done a bunch of individual things. And so though they have more choice and control more what's in, they have the perception of getting less because of what the layout is. So you have to communicate carefully what your messaging is. But so going back to here, you could have a crop failure that's going to limit your capacity to fill that later on. And you might feel like you're not giving your people th their worth. The other thing is, um, like if you're going off farm, you're probably driving things in a delivery vehicle, we can put 110 baskets in, or worth of vegetables in our van. So if suddenly the baskets are 50% bigger here, we would need like 160 baskets worth of space. And so we, so we couldn't fit it in the van. So that's something is by making the, the, the same amount. Um, and then, you know, people eat like the same amount throughout the year. They don't eat more just because there's zucchini available. Um, so, that's, so, that's, so that's how we kind of figure out the pricing. And yeah, so we're looking at often, we're looking at like 8 to 12 items in a share. And again, most of them being stuff that's more staples. And then a couple that are less common. And if we, don't try, we try to mix up the less common so it's not always the same ones uh, week after week. Um, yeah, and one more thing that comes to mind on this is that we do one size basket. We don't do a large and a small, but you can pick up every week or every two weeks. And what we do with that is 
Um, we take the whole group of bi-weekly, so folks pick up every two weeks. We divide it into two. We have one pick up one week and one pick up the other week. Um, and that kind of averages out. We now use a software, sort of like Farmigo, but it's uh, something that's based out of Quebec, that lets people have, log into their account and they can actually change their dates around and they take some vacations and stuff. And we let them do that, but they have to tell us within 40, they have to, they have to do it, like, after, they have to do it before 48 hours, afterwards th their choices are locked. And so we control a little bit about that so we know what we're picking for. We try to pick for the same amount week after week, but there's some variability because of those vacations. Um, Sorry, so in that case, you replace the, the produce later? Uh, so we, we do, we give, we offer, so this is, we've changed our approach to rigidity about vacations. People can take vacations now. Um, we, we give people two options. One is they can move it to another date. So if they're a bi-weekly, they might choose it a week they don't have vegetable. Or if they're a weekly, they're going to double up or even triple up another week. So that's one option. <laughs> the other option is we let bi-weeklies <coughs> cancel one week and weeklies cancel two weeks. And when they cancel the week, they get a credit of $30 that they can spend on other sp like special orders from the farm. Um, and so that gives them a little bit of flexibility if they don't want too many vegetables at another drop-off. And getting that flexibility of controlling for vacations has really increased um, satisfaction. So I think good food is number one, that relationship with the farmer is number two, and number three is flexibility on around people's real lives. Um, and where, you know, at this point when someone tells us, oh, I joined your CSA this summer, but I'm going to be gone for six weeks to go visit family somewhere else. And I was like, sure, you can still join, and we'll just change it so you pick them up at the end. You know, We're just very happy to, to work with whatever situation uh, that people, people, people have. Also, so I said how we have market, we do market style. Um, we bring about five extra items of each item at the drop off. Um, and we do this for a few reasons. One is, if there's a miscount, we want to be able to offset that. Um, Another one is we'll sell a couple different items out of the bins to customers. You know, some extra head of lettuce or an extra zucchini, we'll sell it out of the extras. But also, if someone shows up and is not a member or they come with a friend and they want to try it out, we'll sell a, sh a, a, a trial basket on the spot. You know, they don't have to be signed up and we'll sell it for $35. So they can do a trial basket for $35. We get their email <laughs> and then we'll email them later and ask them if they want to join the, the basket. Um, Another way that we get new members is sometimes people go on vacation and rather than transfer it, they, get, they give it to their friend to take the, the, the vacation. And those people, uh, not to take the vacation, take the vegetables while they're on vacation. And those people there are really prime, you know, because they come here, it's a gift they're getting of the vegetables and it's a chance to have a really positive experience. And we'll give them a postcard with our information on it and encourage, well, we, we're nice to them. We don't necessarily encourage them to get the vegetables. We'll tell them that there's still space if they're, if they're interested, assuming there still is space. Yeah. Other questions about some of these details? Who does CSA? Oh, you were going to ask something? No, go ahead. Okay. Who does CSA here? Is CSA growing or disappearing in this area of the world? For us, it's growing. Yeah. yeah. Other people say it's growing? It's growing, but it's a lot more convenient, slightly delivered. Yeah. Okay. Um, as a general rule, a general question to people here, if someone was starting a new farm, would you recommend they start with a CSA? Well, I would say no. <laughs> <laughs> Fifteen years ago, everybody said that's the way you start. <laughs> yeah, maybe a small farm, maybe it, like a quarter of what you sold. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's... It's a funny thing. There's, there is definitely, as part of the national conversation or North American conversation, there's an idea that CSA isn't doing as well. There are more farms doing it. There's been a lot of stories of people who can't meet their needs and kind of go under or you know, don't, get, don't fulfill the money. And sometimes there's even lawsuits that go out of, after that. Um, and amidst that, there's some farms that are doing phenomenal. <laughs> um, Mm -hmm. A farmer's market is a lot more forgiving. Yeah, farmer's market can be a lot more forgiving. <coughs> yeah. 
Um, I think it's it's an example that things change in the in, in, in the marketing world, and so um, you got to try to find new outlets. Um, but I do really like the relationship it permits with the with with the clients, and in the long term, I think the, so. In the short term, I think farmers market can be more forgiving, but in the long term, I think that these client the, the CSA might be more forgiving in the long term. Not that you want to have a year where you have nothing, <laughs> um, um, but, it, but it gives you a more resilience in that relationship. Whereas a wholesale buyer, they might really like you, but if you don't have the crop, it's hard for them to, to, to work with you. Though, you want to do everything you can to have that crop for the people. Is that good on the uh, CSA details and variety? <laughs> One more thing. OK, so how do you select? You select a couple different ways. At the beginning, like, so you're selecting. You want stuff that you can grow well. So that's something that you need that yield. There might be something you would love to have, but if you haven't grown it before, when you trial it out, start smaller and get bigger. You know, maybe you want to have ginger. You grow a little bit of ginger in your greenhouse before you grow a lot. You know? And um, so that's part of it. You want to talk to your members and see what they like. So. If you're giving choices between two items and one of them is always all gone and the other one is you have your carrot and celery root choice and it's 50-50 at the beginning but halfway through all the carrots are gone and it's all celery root left, that tells you something about what people want. They don't want a lot of celery root. And so you can pay attention to that and you can ask them explicitly and you can survey them. Now surveying is a funny thing because they remember the last week two, three weeks. They don't remember 20 weeks before. So if you survey them once in mid-October and you're asking about how the early baskets were, they don't know. <laughs> um, if you really want to know those early baskets, survey them earlier. You know? So you've got to be careful how you take it. And um, if you have friends who get CSA baskets from other people, but they're not fr farmers, these friends, and then you ask them, what was in your CSA basket? They're like, well. I think we had lettuce last week, and there were like seven cucumbers. And, and you're like, but there wasn't seven cucumbers. They had three cucumbers, but there was four from the previous week they hadn't eaten. But they don't remember that. They just goes out the, the fridge. They don't, like, you know exactly what it's in. And you look at it, you're like, yep, that's 2750 there. I'm a little bit short, but they look at us, oh, it's a bunch of stuff. <laughs> and so they see it through different eyes. And um, so you have to be careful how you ask them about it because they won't necessarily tell you the information that you're actually trying to hear. And so we'll do a question about, you know, what do you want more of, what do you want less of? And people might say they want more cucumbers. But we know that in the peak of the cucumbers, we gave seven cucumbers a week for five weeks. Okay? How many more do you want than seven a week? <laughs> what they really mean is that we gave cucumbers nine weeks out of like 20, they want them the other 11 weeks. So your question doesn't quite get that amount. And so that's something that you have to be careful how you ask things and how you interpret things. And um, so, but, but over time, they will tell you, like paying attention and seeing what they get and what they purchase will tell you what's more popular and what's, and, and what's not. And, um, um, and some things don't surprise you, you know, like you've got cucumbers, carrots, Tomatoes, lettuce, does anybody contest that that's going to be popular in a North American diet? How about beets? Maybe there's 30% of your clients who want beets every week. And there's 30% who never, ever want a beet. <laughs> and there's some in the middle who are happy to have them once every five weeks. So there's, uh, we've actually, we haven't start, we've begun to think of the vegetables in kind of like these, like first tier, second tier, third tier. And like your first tier is stuff that people want all the time. And then second tier is stuff that they want some of the time. Something like onions. I mean, for myself, I put onions in everything all the time. But I've realized I'm, not everybody's like that. There's some people that get one onion, and that's good for them for the whole week. And I, I don't know how they do it, you know? Um, so, um, but that's kind of like we might put in a tier two. And tier three, something like eggplants, there are people who eat eggplants the same way someone else eats cucumbers. Um, I mean, not necessarily raw, but I mean, it's in terms of quantity. 
but, there's, but that's not true for most, most people. It's kind of like maybe thinking of a tier three. And so the tier ones, you want them as much as possible. You know? So it's unfortunate that in our climate, you know, tomatoes are really hard to get in May. But if you start your CSA the first week of May, people want tomatoes at that point, even though you can't do it. So getting a greenhouse is a way to extend that. So those tier one, they, want, they would have them all the time. And they'll go to the store and buy them if they don't get them for you. And then the others, tier two, you put more often. And tier three, you might want to have mostly as a choice. So people can sometimes never, ever have that if they don't want it. Um, and, um, and, and things do change. Like kale is one that might have been a tier four. <laughs> but now it's like sort of a tier two to tier one, depending where you are. Um, there are places, but, but that being said, I recently had a group visiting our farm, and I was showing them kale plants. And somebody, a woman said, what's kale? And I was like, wow. <laughs> it's, um, but, um, but, uh, but 15 years ago, that wouldn't have been the case that everybody knew what kale. That wouldn't have been an oddity. Yeah. Does that kind of answer your question? Yes, yeah. I mean, we, we try to also manage the value of the product. You know, yeah. Complete the number of there is a funny thing about giving more people things to hit the, the money, but having them have things they don't want might actually make the value perceived lower, even though on paper it comes closer to that amount. So you've got to be careful with that. And um, one of the biggest complaints with CSA is having too much food. People hate composting or throwing this stuff out. One, they paid money for it, but two, like they know all the work that went into you, so they feel guilty. And so some people don't renew because they couldn't eat the vegetables, you know? And, um, and that's a tough place. And so I definitely see, like, so if you do let somebody, you know, you can take a two liter container of, um, like a half gallon container of tomatoes, uh, at, at, like at, at sort of the peak tomato season, I'll see some people just take three or four, you know, and just put them in the bag. And they say, you can take more than that. I said, oh no, that's all I'm gonna eat. And, and that's fine, you know? Um, figuring out how to get away for people to get their stuff. There was a hand up there, but I did see yours. Um, speaking of kale, do you see any trends in popularity um, of incoming new veggies that weren't necessarily popular? Well, I did mention radicchio. And I, was, I, was, I, wasn't, I wasn't kidding about that. That's one that, um, so kale, I have been told, is on the way out. Um, and I think that, um, I mean, I think it's going to become something like people like, pe people know about it now and will eat it, but it's not the same. I mean, because it's still the bitter green, right? Like, I mean, I love it. I'll eat it in everything. But it's, it's um, like, it's not everyone who, you know, somebody whose partner is making them eat it because it's good for them, you know, they'd be very happy to have that trend pass. Um, so, um, uh, but, 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 uh, but the bitter greens like radicchios is something that has become much more popular in the, in like the, 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 the fancier restaurants and um, in the foodies. Um, and so will that make it all the way down? Like who would have thought arugula would have been popular? <laughs> like what it, like if you were just to eat that, the average North American is not going to think this is fantastic. I want to get it in a leaf this big and I'm going to put a little nice salad. But, um, but, but people's foods change. You know, there was a time that broccoli and eggplant were very foreign vegetables in, uh, in North America. Switch chart, is that in your show? Like ra rainbow switch chart? I mean, it, it was pretty good a couple of years ago. I don't know what it um, I think, I mean, people eat it. People eat it. I don't think, I think that there was a time where people, like, people knew Swiss chard much more than they did kale. Kale kind of eclipsed it. People are going to keep buying kale and be buy Swiss chard, but I think there was a time about four years ago five years ago where you couldn't get winter boar kale seed anymore. That the seed company that produced it, the demand was, would it, it, it was going to take them three years to build that demand up again, to build that seed supply up. Because like there's, you know, you're, you're, there's a couple steps that go into, because it's a hybrid, you know, a couple steps that get to the point to be able to produce that. And um, so for, for two or three years, you couldn't get winter boar kale. So people started growing some rip boys, started growing some vates kale. And, um, and then I think they weren't planning on increasing the supply too much because they thought that that was going to pass a little bit. And I, and I have heard that from people who, who um, like some, some friends out west who do grow for restaurants, that they can't sell kale the same way they used to be able to it and that they're growing lesser amounts. Um, I mean, but if a quarter of your farm is kale, <laughs> like that seems like a disproportionate amount. Um, so. What are you getting for Um 
What am I getting for radicchio? Um, well, that depends on the size of the head and, and the kind of market that you're in, but it's probably something between $3 and $4 a head, um, maybe up to $5 a head if it's, if, if it's a nice thing. And it, I, it, it depends on your markets. Um, and there is a world of radicchio that is amazing. Like, you know, you have your round radicchios, you have your trevizos that are long and skinny, you have your castelfrancos, like all types that are more white with, with speckles on them, and then you have stuff that's more leafy. There's the sugar loafs, which kind of look like a romaine. Um, there's one that Johnny, uh, High Mowing and Johnny stuff called Virtus. It's an F1 that's um, it's kind of like the easiest sugar loaf to get into because it's the sweetest of them. But, but there's a whole world of diversity in that. Um, and if you, if you go on Instagram, there are a couple farms. There's um, Campo Rosso, and there's another one, Siri Farm, or I think, that have a lot of uh, radicchio pictures that are really phenomenal. Um, and, you know, radicchio, like, so for here, it's kind of a weird vegetable, but there are parts of the world that have been eating it for a really long time as a staple. So it's, it's sub something that tastes can change. Um, I was talking with, uh, with a radicchio breeder, and one of the things, and he's actually of Italian uh, descent, so he he's, he's, you know, eats a certain amount of radicchio, or has, at least culturally is familiar with it. But he said, what you do is, if you're introducing it to somebody, is you put sugar in the vinaigrette. Because you know, our palates love sweet things. And so it's going to like that vinaigrette, and you're going to trick it into starting to like the bitterness. And so that's how you get, slip people into uh, eating radicchio. Um, it's in everybody's coleslaw? Yeah. Oh, you're talking about arugula. I thought you were talking about radicchio. You're talking about yeah, yeah, but like with arugula, it's got the bitterness because of the sweet. The sweet. Yeah. 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 So that kind of feels like we're building into a food culture. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, so part of that we were saying is the, um, is the eating, is, is the actual vegetable, and part of it is the people. And we live in a, in a world that there are so many eating way, ways to eat that don't involve you cooking. And you can buy foods in the grocery store that are pre-made. You can get stuff in um, restaurants. There's a lot of people that don't eat. And so one of the things about a food culture is just cooking at home is like a new novelty for some people. There's a lot of younger people, I guess the millennials, um, who grew up in families that weren't necessarily eating a lot at home and weren't taught how to, how to eat. And now, they would, they, they, this kind of something that they wish, that, kind of there's a nostalgia for something they never quite had, and they want to be part of that. And we're not talking about making fancy meals, though sometimes they like that. Sometimes it's just doing anything with food. And that's something that we as farmers, um, and I'm assuming you cook with some of your own food, I would really hope so, um, but um, teaching your people how to eat and how to cook is a service that you have, like you are a door, a lens for them to see that world. So I would, if you have people that you deal with regularly, so a farmer's market or a CSA or some kind of other way that you're selling directly to, 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 to end consumer, I would definitely have a weekly newsletter. And you can feature a vegetable, you can feature a, re a recipe, but talk about how to eat and use the food and how you eat and use the food. And you can have fancy recipes, but you can also have normal recipes. And you can throw in things like chocolate beet, sa uh, beet cakes or you know, um, zucchini bread or stuff that people kind of know is there and is fairly easy to make but wouldn't think about. Um, yeah. uh, so do you have a thing called Food Link? I don't know if you guys have heard of it or not. But if you sign up for it as a vendor, uh, you get the card and it has a QR code on it and they can scan it and it will tell them um, picking it when it is right, recipes, things to do with it. Um, hmm. Mm -hmm. But they'll send a huge stack, and it's like, what, 75 of them or something for vegetables? Or something. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a great resource to kind of be there. If you're able to mediate that information, then you become the person that, th that's the guide to them doing the eating. And that's part of what they're, um, they're trying to, um, you know, as you're trying to meet, like, that helps build a relationship with them, is when you're, when you're that, that guide to good food and also to good cooking. And um, so I think that's part of a building of food culture. Is there another part of the question? Was it, uh, was it over here that the question, yeah. Was there another part of the question that you have in mind or?
Yeah. yeah. I think you addressed this, but that's where yeah. my brain is at. I think that people don't know how easy it is to cook. Right. <laughs> and that's something that um, people are going to know less and less of that. And that's something of just teaching and transmitting. Um, and uh, I mean, you guys are vegetable producers. I mean, I often deal with seed growers. So what we're talking talk about is how to get people to grow vegetables at home. You know, if um, like we're talking about the profitability of a kale plant. You know, getting six, seven bunches off of a plant, maybe more, um, and that's great from a farmer's perspective. But from an eater's perspective, that's twenty bucks that you're getting off of one plant, and you could easily almost in any context, you could grow four or five plants. So if you're a big kale eater, it could be easy to produce two to three hundred dollars of kale out of a small area in your backyard for the price of a 350 seed packet, you know? And, um, but that's not how people, people think. So there's a lot of parts of that food culture that you can bring, bring home to them. Um, and, um, and eating with people, you know? And maybe if those of you have, who have children, <laughs> you know, that's the place too, is make sure that they're involved in it so that they gain that food culture and that they understand that food starts with a seed and that it grows up and that you pick it from a garden and that it can have dirt on it and still be tasty. Like, these are things that um, you're doing all the time. Um, and um, going talking to, you know, grade schools and that kind of thing. I think the children is a really good place to get into because like, I mean, I think all of us have a certain yearning to have our hands in the, door, in the dirt and understand where, th where the food comes from. But I think children, they don't have any of the cynicism or that that might go with that. They're just excited about that stuff. And, um, and it suddenly makes, like, so much of the world doesn't make sense to them. So bringing sense to food can really be uh, a, a, an exciting thing. Mm -hmm. And that has been amazing because the days he has the grill there, everybody sells better because they are actually trying the produce. I bet, yeah. It's really cool. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, um, farmers markets can be a great food hub uh, to bring people in. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, moving from food culture, we've got a few more um, uh, things here. Um, Challenges, did we address that enough earlier, or do we want to talk about challenges more? OK, I'm going to just, we've talked about that. Ratio of planning for CSA. So in some ways, I've talked about it, about knowing what your yield is and kind of working backward from that. Is that good enough? Yeah, OK. So that leaves us deer and food safety. <laughs> um, they don't go together. <laughs> so deer, 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 deer. <laughs> Um, they can do a lot of damage. And, um, and they're smart. They're smarter than you think. And if you don't have a good, if you're not have the best strategy, they will adapt to what you do. Um, so you could put a deer fence around it. So I think they're, like the best stuff, the stuff that really works is I think there's some deer fence that kind of have like, what's this one? Like a straight part like this. You know, with like high tensile wire, and then another part like this, okay, that's kind of uh, hanging. And what happens is, there's, I think that they see the height and they see kind of the width, and it kind of confuses them, and they won't jump over something like this. Um, now you can have a fence that's just like that, and most of the time, they won't jump over it. But if they learn, they can jump over it, and they can jump pretty high. Once they've learned they can do it, this fence doesn't matter to them. And that's the problem of them learning, kind of thinking around what you're doing. Some people will have just one piece of electric fence, you know, on the, what, on the, on the, what do you call it, the, the generator, I guess, the, um, the fencer. And you have, like, you put, um, on the what? Battery. On the battery. But there's a, yeah, on the, yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you put on, um, 
my words are leaving, aluminum foil <laughs> with peanut butter on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so there, you're training them to come to it and to lick it and to get zapped. And then they don't like this spot. But if you leave it up too long in that spot, they get used to being around the walk around. So you move the line around so they try it in different spots and they just don't like your garden. Um, but this is, I mean, there's nothing here that they can't, it's, it's a mental thing that you're doing with them. Um, what do other people do about, hear about deer? We have a heavy, heavy deer population. Just two days ago, we had 32 deer standing in one acre of our oh garden my space. Oh my so um, we tried it all. The owl, the reflective tape, the double fencing, 10 foot fencing. Um, if they're determined, they will run through the fencing. Um, so the, I'm, when I'm saying 10 foot, I'm talking about the netting. Mm -hmm. So the biggest thing that's worked for us is an object called the scarecrow. And you hook it to a hose and it's motion activated and it squirts them with water. Mm. <laughs> and then the other thing that's worked the best is we got, I, I don't know what you call them. I call them the car wash guy. The floppy little. Yeah. yeah <laughs> it runs on a solo charger and we move him around the field. So since he's new and he's constantly moving. He scares me. He scares me. Because I'm thinking, what the heck's moving in my field? Um, but yeah, so once a week we have to move the car wash guy around. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the scarecrow thing, that's the brand name of that water thing. Yeah. But so for five or six years we've been fighting with deer. And that's the only thing that's lasted more than three years. Because mm -hmm. they do learn. And the peanut butter thing works, but then next year's crop of babies might not even touch the peanut butter. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, is that... That was your question, wasn't it? Yeah, I, was, I, didn't, I didn't know if there was anybody trying anything like putting plant, like quote unquote deer resistant plants in certain places and putting more yeah. stuff deer like in other places away from the garden to kind of almost attract them, but away from the stuff that you don't want them to get. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Because yeah, supposedly echinacea. they don't like pumpkins and echinacea, right. but that only works for a short time. I was going to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Garbage. What's that? Yeah. Irish spring soap. I'm a, I'm a landscaper. I'm a landscape business for also. I put sashes. Yeah. So I the same thing. 20, 30 deer around one home. Beautiful location and all that. But I put them and hit them under the uh, weed guard. Hmm. Um, I couldn't believe. They, they said, no matter what you put down, it's going to go. So I put echinacea. I put all deer friendly bushes and, and plants around. But I put these little sashes of Irish spring. Hmm. It goes back to like <laughs> a lot of that depends on how bad your deer pressure is. Some of that stuff will work, you know, if you only have a few deer. I have a few deer, um, and I have like a six foot deer netting, and I do ma regular, you know, maintenance on it, but um, they can jump it if they want to, um, but they don't because they're not starving. But if they've had their habitat cut down and they're starving, almost nothing will work. Mm -hmm. See, yeah. that's, that's what I'm, I'm just, I'm not trying to get rid of them. I'm just trying to give them something else to, other than I wouldn't what I'm try to sell. that. <laughs> I, I would let them find their own meal. Don't give Don't them Don't give anything. them a reason to come around. No. Yeah. <laughs> we have a heavy coyote population, so our deer is not like it. Yeah, and with moles. Yeah. Um, <laughs> does anybody have idea about moles? One year that worked, um, we took a um, peppermint milky form to kill the grubs. The baby moles will eat the grubs. Hmm. Um, but then last year, but nothing worked except for my dog punched them. And so whenever she stops, my husband comes out with pitchforks. <laughs> <laughs> Direct action. So, yeah, so yeah, we've had we've had people offer to rent our dog. Um, <laughs> it's so tiresome. But milky for really the colonies seem to help to work to help cut down the grass. Mm. Yeah, using the, the 
get rid of the grub that kind of works for a little while and then you just put it right back. So, so then you're hmm. and it's probably going to be taken a little bit further because it's already long. And, and it, we ended up having to mine all of our bins with hardware box, like a metal hardware box. Mm -hmm. So I want to expand quite a bit this year, and I'm not looking forward to buying a bunch of hardware box. <laughs> So you're saying there's a there's a, a harpoon trap? Yeah. Yep. Well, it's a, not a fatal trap. There's a different form, but it's sticky enough. Finding their their actual you run. Find the actual run. Yeah. Hmm. But dogs will steal them too. Yeah. <laughs> the harpoon trap. A good farm dog can really make a difference, especially if it's outdoors. Um, yeah, we, I mean, we're not in a cr crazy deer population where we are, but um, maybe about, I don't know, 10 miles away there are some, like, or even two miles down the road we'll see some. And I think it's the dogs on our farm that, 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 that keep them down. Um, but as I was telling somebody, like the, the dog that's in that picture, that dog was amazing. That dog took down a coyote, and um, he, that dog has moved on. Um, so the, the dog that we have currently is not quite the same, doesn't it? <laughs> so, um, We've seen more more creatures come, but um, yeah. I I had a lot of voles, um, and they have they make these things for moles and voles that there's a spike that goes in the ground and their solar power they mm -hmm. they vibrate every thirty seconds or so or and I had pretty good luck with those, uh, but you have to buy a lot of them. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. What is your problem with the mold? Took up my last two. Yeah, the, the biggest problem that I'm having in particular is just that I can't. So I, everything I grow is in my backyard, and I can't walk through my backyard. I've had people trip and fall because the oh. mold tunnels. They just they're they're all over the place. So I, I haven't see. noticed it necessarily reducing like the crop, but I have just a, a difficult time having people walk through the yard because there's so many. found that the more we tilled, the less we had of that too. You're kind of destroying habitat a bit. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm going to wrap this one up, the deer one on this, and the mole one. Um, um, and this leaves us food safety on this list. How are we doing for time? We still got a bit of time after this. So food safety, um, is this about like regulations and procedures and stuff and protocols on farms? The, qu the question that? I was just wondering that how, you, how much it plays into your planning for your crop. So some crops require washing, some don't. So you have to manage your containers appropriately. That's yeah. So um, in Canada, there's not, like, I, it's, it's different from some of the food safety regulations. Um, and I think it also depends on who your buyer is, you know, if it's, a, if it's an industri or industrial buyer or like somebody who has other re regulations. Um, so we don't have anything specific that we have to do. We, um, what would I say in, in terms of planning? Um, you know, a couple times a year we do wash things out with bleach to sterilize them. We try, you know, we're, I'm not sure I have a good answer on you on that. We're not, like, we're, we're clean, <laughs> is, is, is how we have it. We have a clean wash station that's easy to wash down. Um, we have a salad spinner that's, that's easy, easy to wash down. Um, and we try to clean out bins quickly so you don't have stuff sitting around rotting in them. Um, and, um, um, yeah, so I don't, I don't have a lot to say on that. Um, yeah, if, if, if you are, and like we don't use Sanidate or some of those other uh, products, we've, th we've thought about it. Um, and I think they might be a good idea for like salad greens. Um, yeah. 
But if you are a new grower, it is something to be aware of what kind of regulations there might be. Is, is there any kind of like food safety regulations that people should know about around here? Or? Any new farmer ought to take the class. Yeah. Just take the class. And get and go on record as taking the class because in I don't know how many years it is from now, but one person from every farm is required to take it if your farm's over a certain size. So most of the laws, farms that sell under like half a million dollars worth of product are exempt from most of it, but not all of it. So you really need to just take the class. They offer it here usually, or different, you know, opportunities around the state. It's just worth it, and then you have that credential. And what's the class called? It's FISMA training. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. not. It's not the same as GAP, it's but. The Safety Alliance. It's a, yeah. All right, so we've run out of questions. <laughs> um, well, it turns out I'm wrong. I was wondering if you charge for tours of your farm. Um, no, we don't charge for tours on our farm, but we don't always say yes. <laughs> okay. However, when somebody wants to pay for a, a tour, we will usually accept the money. <laughs> Um, and, 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 I, and I say that a little bit tongue in cheek because sometimes there's an organization that wants to pay for the tour and if they're getting funding to do it, I'm very happy to do it. But if I know it's coming from their coffers and they could spend on something else, I'm also like, it's not the money that makes us say yes. It's wanting to teach somebody that says yes. It can be nice to get paid also. And so um, we give tours to other farmers, other farm grip groups. Anybody associated with farming, we'll give them a tour almost at the drop of a hat. Because like, that's how we learned. Like, we, were, we worked on other farms. So many farmers have opened their farms to us. People like, I'll go to a new place. Like, I don't have time to stay here right now because I have to go visit my brother after, after this conference. But if I was here for a week, I'd probably call up a few farms. And almost never does someone say no. They say, come, in, come out and, and see stuff. And sometimes they just walk us around. Other times we wind up sitting down, eating a meal, and staying there for a long time. Some people we stay in touch with a long time after, sometimes never talk to them again. And, uh, but I find that farmers like to share, and so it's our, kind of our role to also do that. And I don't know if this list, I'm going to have 30 people coming to our farm this summer. But, <laughs> but, um, but, but so, so in that regards, we say yes, because I think it's, it's important to have more farmers. Um, when it's foodies or people interested in food culture, that's something I'm much more careful about. So we have an open house in early July, and for, on a Saturday, we're open from 10 to 3, and we just have tour after tour after tour, and we're just there. We, a number of our staff are there, and we're just there to answer questions. And that's when people ask to visit our farm, I generally will push them to that spot. Um, if it's a CSA member, I probably would, you know, they have a, a relative who's in town, who's a farmer from somewhere else, or I guess that's the farmer card still, but we're, we're, we're more, you know, someone we're closer to will have, uh, we'll say yes more. I, I get Girl Scouts, garden clubs, like groups like that, and they say, because I have a farm stand, and I say, well, yes, and the farm stand will be open, but then they don't buy anything. Mom mm -hmm. and Tot groups, and I'm kind of sick of being their entertainment. Yeah, I, and I can appreciate that, so, that, that side. Like some people, sometimes, you, for a context, you're just a perfect spot to go see. Um, I think that f farm tours ca can bring new clients to you. I mean, there is, you, it, if there really is a steady flow, I think getting paid for it might make a difference because you're turning into agro-tourism. But um, um, it, if you are trying to build a CSA, getting the most people onto your farm is the best way for them to see what it is, and that's a chance for them to have a contact with them. Um, something is also, is we're always on the lookout for great staff. And I often find that people who will come on a farm visit or like from a class, that's a potential to get somebody great. And sometimes at the, end of the, at the end of the time, someone will say, do you ever hire anybody? And then I'll start talking. You see one person in the back, their eyes light up. <laughs> and then afterwards, I talk to that person. And you know, it's not always a perfect fit, but often it is. You know, there's a few people that have worked for us right now that we got just because they came on a farm tour. And so um, I do recognize that it can be abused, but it is, um, it is a way to outreach your, your community. 
You can also set certain parameters of if you come, you know, it's this amount per person, um, or um, it's just a fit flat amount for tours. And when they contact you, you can say, this is our fee. We're open to negotiation. Um, that, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I think it's, it's very honest. It, it shows that you value your time and that you think what you're offering is worthwhile. And they think it also. Otherwise, they wouldn't come to see your farm. <laughs> so, um, but um, yeah. Other questions? Just really quick, um, are there any like books you would recommend? Oh. Or, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Other than yours. Um, oh, I wasn't actually saying that. I was saying books. There's, yeah, that is a, there's one book I would recommend <laughs> above all the others. But um, no, there's a lot of good farming books. Um, when I, I think I said at the beginning, when we started, there was Elliot Coleman, and I do recommend his books. Um, but there was a lack. One of the when we wrote our book, part of it was there was a lack of like technical planning detail in these books. But nowadays, um, um, there's a lot of really good books. So I guess so. You already guys already know the Market Gardener, right? Anybody not know Jean Martin's The Market Gardener? Okay. Um, so there was Curtis Stone has The Urban Gardener. This is a great book for if you want to get into small areas and you want to grow salad greens and especially sell to restaurants. This is a great book for that. Um, he's on YouTube too. He's on YouTube. Like he has a, like he's on. There's a lot of him on YouTube. Yeah. Um, actually, we'll talk about podcasts after because that's another thing. Um, there's the Urban Gardener. There's the Lean Farm. Um, does everybody here know the Lean Farm? Does, he, I mean, this is an Indiana farmer. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, so the lean, anybody not know the lean farm? Okay, the lean, so lean is a management system that's created by Toyota, and it has to do with a lot of simplifying your, your operations, value your customer. And so this system was applied to agriculture, and so Ben Hartman writes that. Um, there's Richard Wiswall's the, the Organic Business Handbook. Do you know that book? Yeah. This is a little bit older. Um, it's also from Chelsea Green. And this has some of the, the planning stuff, but kind of gets into, um, I think handbook is, it's called, B, it's uh, Richard Wiswall. Um, and he does a lot of like crop budgeting, but also how you organize your office. There's um, fearless, so, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, there's fearless farm finances. It's a blue book. <laughs> and it's really if you wanna jump into, um, Accounting. This one of the co-authors was Chris Blanchard of uh, the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Um, there's some other co-authors in there too. Um, this is this is I'm not going to say heavy, but it's really in depth. There's also one called oh, what's it called? The farms the farmer office. What's it called? The farmer's office. The farmer's office. Yeah. I so I used to I, so I, I still like this book, but the farmer's office is a little bit more accessible, and it's a fantastic introduction to business analysis. Like, if you didn't understand how profit analysis statements and balance sheets and all this stuff all works together, she does a fantastic job of, of, of presenting it. Um, what are other books that I really like? I mean, there's a book that just came out recently um, that I haven't read much, but called the No-Till Hand, I think it's No-Till Handbook. It got published this last month or so um, from New Society Publisher. Um, so it kind of focuses on some smaller farms. Um, so these are some of the books that, that, I might, that I might recommend. There's a lot of other books out there. Um, and then if you're getting into like medicinal herbs or flowers, like there's all other books that fit into that. Um, in terms of, so there's the magazine Growing for Market. I'll just call it GFM, Growing for Market. Anybody here not know Growing for Market? So Growing for Markets, it's like it's in the 20th or 25th year that it's producing, and it's, it really focuses on um, well, growing for market. <laughs> there is a bit of livestock, but there's also flowers and vegetables. And um, there was a time where I thought it was the best information available. It's still really good. Um, but there's some really great podcasts, I think, that have started to fill that niche. And so um, there's usually at least one really good article in it. But sometimes there's a few really good articles in it. In terms of podcasts, I mean, the one I think that the best one was the Farmer to Farmer. and. Um, uh, especially episode 50 with a really fantastic crop planner. <laughs> but um, but um, uh, Chris Blanchard passed away last year, and this was his podcast. And 
This was phenomenal. This, these, these, like, there's like 160 something of them, and they're all worth listening to. They're different scale operations, but um, he's a really great interviewer, and it's really good to see how his questions evolved over time, but really gets into the nitty gritty of it, and does not gloss over the challenges, but also kind of pulls out the successes of the farms. And um, I would definitely give that a, a, a listen to. There's um, another one called, well, so now it's called Farm Smart, Farm Small, Farm Small, Farm Smart. Does anybody know if I have that right? Anybody, not, anybody listening to this? So this is uh, D Farm Small, Farm Smart. This is Diego Footer, who used to have, used to be called Permaculture Voices, and then he kind of rebranded and split it into um, Farm Small, Farm Smart, which was initially, he did, I think, two seasons of following week by week Curtis Stone but then he's branched into to other, uh, other speakers. Um, lately, he's had a few episodes with Ben Hartman that have been really great. Um, he has some with other people, too. So there, this is really like, this is farming in all its glory and beauty. Like, he really talks with everyone. And you can really see that Chris loves farming. This is focused a lot more on small. So it's a different perspective. Um, also loves farming. It's really coming in a, a smaller perspective. Um, and also, um, what does this say about it? That often they interview a lot of newer farmers, so people who have new ideas, and maybe what they work is working now, but it might not work in two or three years, so you, so you don't always know. But hey, if you like listening to farmers. <laughs> um, so these are two podcasts that I particularly like. Um, are there other podcasts that people listen to that are farming? Well, farm Small, Farm Smart. Is Farm Small, Farm Smart? But if you have like, the Stitcher app, which is a podcast app, yeah. Mm -hmm. there's, there's more and more. Um, are they all good? Well, you have to listen to all to find out. Um, some, of them, some of them, the production quality isn't as, as fantastic. Yeah. Does Diego have also a YouTube channel? Because I think I saw you. He has. I don't know if he still has it, but he has had one, yeah. Yeah. Um, but no one else, any other podcasts that they'd really recommend? There's a new one. I, I listen to it. It's called the No-Till Farm Podcast. Oh, yeah. I haven't even heard about that. The No-Till Farm Podcast? No till market garden podcast. It's the guy from Kentucky. From Kentucky? Okay. No till market garden. I have to add that one on. Yeah. There's some hands going up in the back. I don't know if it's just yeah. Um, the ruminant. Oh, the ruminant. Yeah, that's Canadian. Yeah. Yeah, he kind of goes does book reviews. He does all kinds of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard about that, but I haven't listened to it. In her boots? That's a great title. Mm -hmm. They also run, In Her Boots also runs workshops in the Wisconsin area, but they did Ben Hartman's farm and they did some in Illinois and it's kind of a, they have a radius. Okay, yeah. So there's a lot out there. And if you don't like oh, another one, Oh, yeah. That's probably the biggest one right now. Like, OK. So, there's, um, so this is Facebook pages that you can join in. OK, so I'll just market garden success is one of them. What's the second? So that's the Michael Kilpatrick. Is that in the field consultants, or does it have a different name? Or? 
Oh, lettuce growers, yeah. Market garden, success. Yeah, there's also, he also has, um, there's like a CSA group podcast. Uh, there's also a winter growers. Um, and you were saying one in Indiana? That, that And something that happens with the Facebook is that it can get, especially Market Garden success, is that it can get diluted by new people coming on and asking questions that have been asked before. And so there can be a little bit of frustration that happens with that. Not that that should keep you from involving and getting into these communities and asking stuff. There's, there's a lot of, this is one that Jean Martin had started, and there's a lot of top notch growers who are actively part of it. Like, uh, there's all kinds of names that people that, will, that, that, that comment and, and, and go on stuff. Um, there's another, like, back onto the lettuce growers, there's another name that comes up a lot. There's Ray Tyler, um, who uh, um, was kind of in the lettuce growing community. I think he's in Tennessee, maybe. But, uh, yeah, and I guess that opens the whole door of online classes, <laughs> and so there's there's a million of them out there, and um, and they're at a different price point. You know, there's um, you know anywhere from a couple hundred bucks to like fifteen hundred bucks, um, and uh, so like Jean Martin has one, um, the Curtis Stone has an urban farmer one. Um, there's a lean farm. One. What's that? They have one together. Yeah, they have one together also. Yeah. Right, yeah, subscription service, yeah. So there, there's, so there's all kinds of stuff out there. And anybody here taking any of those online courses? That wants, which one are you taking? The Ray Tyler. The Ray Tyler one, and how are you liking that? I just started with it, it's, it's pretty good. I mean, he's got really quality videos. And yeah. That's, yeah, he's, he's good at explaining things. And mm -hmm. pretty, they're short, but sweet. Yeah. Anyone else taking any of, of these online courses that wants to share? No, Anyone thinking about it? They have a lot of talks that you can watch on YouTube. Like yeah, there's. JM and do conference presentations and things like that if you can't afford the classes. Yeah. It's amazing how much is out there that's available for free or paid. Roxbury <laughs> and, uh, Farms. Rox yeah, Roxbury Farms. This is. Um, yeah, Roxbury Farm has been around for a long time. This is, he's, this is going back to the original CSA farms, uh, in the US at least. And uh, this is Jean-Paul Cortens. He's in is it Massachusetts or? New York. New York? OK. Um, out there. <laughs> and um, he has a bunch of documentation on his site um, related to harvest pr uh, procedures, cover cropping, all kinds of stuff. He's, um, like, he's been at this before a lot of these other names and has been sharing and is still sharing and will probably keep on sharing. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's a, a lot of, there's a lot of resources out there. And so kind of going back to one of the things I said at the beginning was it's good to know what your experience is, what your strengths are, and also what your weaknesses are. And these, there's somebody <laughs> that can meet or there's a resource that can tackle that. And um, you can also get into, there's a whole world now of marketing type information. There's um, a farmer, Karina Bench. Um, I don't know if it's one or two ends. But she, um, I think she kind of got her launch a little bit through the Farmer to Farmer podcast, the episode that was on her, which um, kind of brought her to a bigger limelight. But she, uh, she has a Facebook page about, uh, I don't know if it's called CSA Farm Marketing or, um, but she talks a lot about you know, sales funnels and email lists and that kind of stuff. And it's, it's a part of the toolkit that I think that we don't, you guys are here t because clock piling sounds fun, but you don't necessarily think about the marketing part. Maybe some of you do, I'm sure some of you do, but there is, there's a, a whole world to get into that and a whole other world of podcasts that, um, uh, that you can get into on that stuff too. So it's, um, there's a lot of really great resources out there. And it's good to kind of, I mean, it's also easy to, to, to sink into this. Oh, yeah, and there's also Instagram. <laughs> you know, so there's a million farms. One of the things that I've been hearing about is a lot of people are following the, um, so these Japanese lean farms that I think are doing some really fantastic stuff. I don't know any names off the top of my head. I try to stay away from that one. Um, but it's easy to get to, like, so I think you should always be learning. And I think you really should be trying to get information in. But you do have to do the farming. And you do have to do the planning. And so it's good to know 
what you're trying to get to. And if we're going to, maybe we'll wrap, start to wrap things up here, let you guys out 10 minutes early, <laughs> but um, is know what you're trying to get to. You know? So there's that quality of life and is that financial goal. And f design the farm that's bringing you to that financial goal. And design the farm that means that if it's a drought, you're able to irrigate your carrots and that you're not losing them. Like what makes you profitable and what you see on these smaller farms is that every plant really counts. And if you can create, develop systems that will bring the majority of seeds you sow to maturity, you will have crop to sell. And, and at that point, it's just about figuring out how to sell it. And um, not that that's going to be easy, <laughs> but um, that's really what you want to get to. And if you're looking for that kind of information. Um, so thank you so much for going through this uh, exploration. <laughs> and um, I'll be here the next two days, one, uh, no, tomorrow. And I'll be talking about um, seed production, I think, in one of the talks. I'll be talking about uh, more co-ops and human resources in another talk. And um, so um, maybe I'll see some of you all there. And uh, yeah, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.